All right. So the lecture that you signed up for is called How to Recognize a Great Debater or Become One Yourself. And this is a new elective. And the kind of background for this, or the motivation for this, or what brought this on, is that I was thinking about how many years now I've done the HSS program. And this is year six, which is a lot of years. Uh, and I've been teaching debate now for quite a bit longer than that. And I spend a lot of time figuring out how to make debaters better. And I've kind of settled on a, on a general philosophy of what you need to do to be good at debate. And I've shared that many times, and it makes its way into a lot of my lectures. The three things that I always say that debaters have to do to be good at debate, number one, is that they have to know what they're talking about. Number two, is that they have to be ready to tell other people what they're talking about. And number three, is that they have to be effective at telling other people what they're talking about. And I still think that's true, and I will still use that kind of as a guiding way to, to think about what makes a good debater or how you get better at debate. That's really the context for that. To get better at debate, you either have to know more, you have to be more prepared to say what you know, or you have to be better at saying what you know. Those are kind of the three ways to improve at debate if you think about it foundationally. But there have been a lot of debaters that I've worked with that were not just good, but they were great. And I think about debate a lot, and I, I often think about what is it that separates the many, many good debaters that I've judged or coached or worked with during the summer from the few debaters, and it's not a ton of debaters, that I think of as sort of great debaters, historically great debaters, the kind of debaters that um, will be remembered for, for many, many years as excellent debaters. So for example, we just had um, Caitlin Talmadge come to give us a, the HSS Labs a guest lecture and um, Alex Lennon said that David Glass said she was the greatest debater, high school debater of the 1990s. So I was thinking about you know, what, what does that mean when, when coaches say this is one of the greatest debaters, what does that really mean? And so I thought a lot about it, and this is my first attempt at outlining my answer to that. Um, there are a lot of things that I'm not going to talk about in this lecture that I think are true of all good debaters. And hopefully these are the kind of things that you come to debate camp to learn. These are the kind of things that, that are somewhat obvious. Um, all good debaters work hard at debate. All good debaters have good fundamental skills. They're good at flowing. They're good at speaking. They're good at line by line. They're good at comparison, evidence comparison, argument comparison, impact comparison. They're pretty knowledgeable both about the topic and about other things. So they're just kind of well-read as people. Not a lot of dumb people are, are good at debate. They're well-organized, things like that. Um, this lecture is going to be more philosophical, and it's going to talk about some different things that I don't think you're commonly told um, at least not directly or in a kind of cohesive way um, at debate camp or by your debate coaches or by former debaters. So there's three parts to this. The first part is an observation that I have that a great debater would excel in any debate format. And I'll explain why I think that's true. The second part is what I have described as my universal theory of the great debater. Uh, and that is that great debaters understand that debate is a fundamentally social thing and why that's important. And the third part is a list of what I think are the essential qualities of a great debater. And these are the kinds of qualities that are more fundamental or foundational than stuff like, you know, is good at the politics DA or is really fast. So section one, a great debater would excel in any debate format and why I think that's true. So there are a lot of weird things about policy debate that are not true of, of basically any other argumentative context in the world that you will ever um, find yourself in. There's a really fast delivery, which is strange. There is a very strange method of citing and using evidence. There is a kind of weird tendency toward world-ending impacts. There is a, a really kind of fetishistic embrace of critical theory and especially fringe theory. But I think that the fundamental conditions of a policy debate are the same as any other debate format. And that includes debate formats that are offered in high school, so competitive events, public forum, Lincoln Douglas, student congress, whatever the other ones are. I think it shares a lot of the same characteristics as public debates, so debates in front of a public audience, whether at your school, at a town hall meeting, at a think tank, just kind of on a street corner in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, I think the fundamental conditions are the same as academic debates, either written or verbal, oral, in scholarly settings, books, journals, articles, conferences. I think the fundamental conditions are the same 
for legal debates, like those in front of an appellate court or the Supreme Court, I think they're the same as the many kinds of business debates that would occur in a boardroom or in a meeting of high-level managers at a company. But what I've found is that high school debaters think a lot less about the connections between what they do and what all those other debaters do in the various ways that debate occurs. And they, they focus a lot more on the differences between debate events or even the differences within one debate event. And in this case, I'm talking about policy debate. So debaters kind of think way too much of the difference between policy debate and Lincoln-Douglas debate or Lincoln-Douglas debate and public forum debate or whatever. Even within policy debate, I think debaters make way too much of the difference between critique debate and policy debate or traditional debate and non-traditional debate. Or even between things that I find really strange, like the difference between being a second affirmative and being a second negative, or the difference between uh, you know, debating in California or debating in Georgia or debating in Illinois. Obviously, there are differences, and they are relevant. But the differences between all of those things aren't really that significant. They're not fundamental. And so I think that most of the great debaters that I have worked with, coached, judged, etc., would all succeed in any debate form. Uh, if you put them in a public forum debate, they would excel. If you put them in a legal debate, they would excel. Obviously, there would be a period of adjustment where they have to familiarize themselves with the new context, with the new set of literature that they're discussing, with the expectations of that community. But I think that the fundamental skills that set a debater apart as great and not just good or competent are skills that transcend any particular type of debate or even any particular uh, setting for a debate. So by that I mean a good high school policy debater has the same set of skills, a great high school policy debater has the same set of skills as someone who's a great debater in a business setting or in, in an academic setting. Uh, and the fundamental insight that I think separates the great debater from all other debaters is that fundamentally and kind of at a almost at the level of their soul or their just their total um, foundational belief in debate is that it is a social thing and not a technical thing. And that is what leads me to my universal theory of the great debater, which is the second part of this. And that universal theory is that great debaters understand that debate is fundamentally social. And I'm going to explain why that's important. So the reason that debate exists and I don't think that enough people really think about this, is because difference exists, and as a result of difference, there is disagreement. So the only reason that we have debate, that humanity has debate, and different civilizations or cultures within humanity have different degrees of debate, uh, is because there is difference within that community, and that difference leads to disagreement. One of my favorite books about argumentation is a relatively obscure, recent book called Why We Argue and How We Should by two Vanderbilt professors, philosophy professors, uh, named Aiken and Tallis. And they summarize their position and kind of their theory of argumentation as follows. They say, disputes arise among people who disagree, and arguments must be designed to address disputes in ways that could provide a resolution to disagreements. In order to resolve a disagreement, the arguments that are proposed must actually address the disputants and attempt to provide them with reasons to come to agree. Accordingly, even a formally unimpeachable argument can fail if it is unable to, to fulfill the social role of argumentation. To put the matter in a nutshell, in order to be successful, arguments must be sufficiently dialectical. So then they discuss what it means to be sufficiently dialectical, and they say there are two conditions that make an argument sufficiently dialectical. The first, is that an argument must be composed not merely of reasons that support its conclusion, but of reasons that its target audience can recognize as reasons. And one of the examples they give is that appealing to the authority of the Pope in a dispute between Catholics and non-Catholics about the permissibility of something like stem cell research is a failure of the dialectical process because the non-Catholic side would not acknowledge that argument as a reason, a legitimate reason. The second condition of an argument being sufficiently dialectical is that it must address the most pressing concerns and doubts that prevail among the target audience. That is, in order to attempt to resolve a disagreement, we must not only assess the reasons for one of the sides, we must assess the reasons for both sides. And so the way that I would summarize that is I would say that a successful argument must be convincing to its audience. And that seems like such a simple thing, but I think that that's one thing that the vast majority of students that I work with don't really understand, or they don't 
fully understand the ramifications of that idea. To make an argument that is convincing to one's audience, a debater must overcome that particular audience's concerns and doubts. And in order to do that, a debater must be familiar with both sides of a particular question or issue. I think a lot of you and a lot of people that will be watching this online will immediately think, oh, Batterman is saying that switch side debate is good, because that's the context in which most of you are familiar with this idea, that you need to know both sides of an issue. But this is a wholly different uh, issue or different position than the one over the practical or ethical costs and benefits of a switch side format in a competitive debate. Aiken and Talos' argument isn't, you know, debate should be switch side. It's an argument about the switch side format of thinking about arguments, and it's a description of what a successful debater must know and do to achieve their goals, regardless of what the eventual argument is that they propose. Uh, the kind of simplest way to summarize that, and the, the reason that I use this term, is that a debater must understand the social context of the disagreement into which they have entered. Every debate, regardless of whether it is a high school policy debate, round one at Greenhill, or a Supreme Court legal battle, or the final round of the public forum, TOC, or a heated debate about a merger in a boardroom, or the you know, final round of the Harvard Round Robin and Lincoln Douglas debate, or an important scholarly back and forth uh, at a conference about the causes of war, or something like that. They all have a particular social context, and the best debaters have a mastery of that context. They understand that social context in which the disagreement takes place, and because of their kind of intuitive, deep understanding of the social context of the disagreement, they are better able than all of their peers to marshal the best arguments for their position in the context of that social context, in the context of that audience. In another of my lectures called Judge Psychology, which is available on my YouTube channel if you haven't watched it before, I discuss one aspect of this, which I think a lot of students will immediately think of when I introduce this idea, which is what most debaters would call judge adaptation. And while I think many debaters, especially once you start to get to be a junior, maybe even late in your sophomore year, but certainly by the time you're a junior or senior, you get it that different judges are different. You start to read their judge philosophy before the debate. Sometimes you, you get really obsessed with that. In my lecture um, about judge psychology, I advance a slightly different claim, which is that about 10% of judge adaptation involves adapting to a particular judge. So adapting to Judge X versus Judge Y, adapting to Scott Wheeler versus Maggie Berthume versus John Voss versus whoever. And the other 90% involves adapting to the fact of judging, which is the universal experience that any person, regardless of their preferences, has uh, when they enter into the position of being a judge. And I go into a great um, detail about that. Uh, the nature of that position, when you put someone in the position of a judge, regardless of what they think about debate, there are just certain things that are true of all judges. They have to vote for one team, they have to vote against one team. They have to be able to defend their decision in a post round. They have to try to be fair to both teams, and they feel very bad about making one team sad and one team happy. The role of the judge, certainly I think debaters get that one better than the rest of what I'm going to talk about, but that's really only one part of the social context or social location of a debate. Another is the larger, kind of broader context of a debate. Uh, and that involves questions like, where is the debate taking place? Is this at a debate tournament? What kind of debate tournament? What is the nature and experience of the people who are participating in this debate tournament? What is the shared background of the people at this debate tournament? What does this debate tournament's community or its set of people value? Who has social capital within this community? in this debate tournament's community? Who doesn't have social capital? Why? Why not? And there are many questions um, related to that. As policy debaters, I think students are often confronted with, and we focus a lot on how divided policy debate is. Policy debate has deep disagreements over what types of arguments should be you know, privileged, what types of uh, debate positions you know, should be the norm, should the affirmative have to be topical, are critiques the thing that the negative should say, should they say politics to say, the process mm -hmm. counter plans, Debates about whether you know the TQPQ or TU can't be a QPQ, stuff like that. And all understanding all those disagreements is really important. But the disagreements are themselves part of something broader that encompasses not just all of the current disagreements, but the history of those disagreements and the, the time that certain people have entered and left the activity uh, shapes the understanding. So one example that I provided in lab uh, already this summer is that the topics that your peers have debated 
in previous years, dramatically af af affects or shapes the current social context for this year's topic. And to an even greater extent, perhaps, the resolutions and topics that your judges debated on has a big effect on how the current year's topics play out. Uh, other factors, like where someone went to uh, debate camp or who someone has been coached by, and just kind of what the, what the social norms and what the, um, the predominant positions and what the marginalized positions are within a community, all plays into helping a debater understand the, the overarching context for which a debate takes place. So my insight is that all debates are played on a different playing field. Every time you get into a debate, regardless of whether it's a debate at a debate tournament or with your parents or in school or in business or in front of the Supreme Court, there's a different playing field every time. And that playing field is a lot broader and deeper than a lot of students understand. So to put it in terms of a debate tournament, round one at Greenhill is not a blank slate. It's not the same as last year's round five, round seven, or whatever your last round was at the TOC, or round 14 at the NFL Nationals, NSDA Nationals. It's not the same as round one at Green Hill the previous year. And everyone's round one at Green Hill is not the same. There are a lot of variables that kind of interact to shape the social context for a particular debate. So your opponents in round one at Green Hill help shape the particulars of the social context for that debate. So where did those students go to debate camp, or didn't they go to debate camp? Who have they been coached by most recently and in the past? Who shaped their formative years in debate? You know, who initially taught them how to debate? What arguments or values do they find appealing based on those relationships? What can we know about the, 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 the kind of baggage, the backpack that the other team brings to the debate that's filled with all of the stuff that shapes their understanding of debate? The same thing is true of your judge. Do they work at a debate camp? If so, where? What was the kind of culture of that debate camp argumentatively in terms of the norms of the debate camp? How old are they? And in other words, where, you know, what is their previous experience? What topics have they coached on? What arguments um, have they found resonant? What arguments have they not found resonant? Kind of what is their um, background in terms of coaching? What have their previous teams like to say? What have their previous teams not like to say? But it's also your opponents, your judges, like I think a lot of you get that. Maybe you don't quite get the how deep that can go. But what about just kind of what else has come to the Green Hill tournament? What is the, how many students in the, in the field have gone to a particular camp? How many students in the field uh, have familiarity with a certain understanding that, that they've gotten either from the summer or from their interactions with one another? In a, in a very connected debate environment, you all spend a lot of time Snapchatting each other, chatting with each other. You know, nothing that happens anywhere is ever a secret. It's always shared. And through those shared interactions, you all are forming an argumentative community, kind of a a social context that is uniquely your own, and it will evolve from round one to Green Hill. And then, you know, what is X team's new affirmative? What if Y team read? Oh, well, four teams broke this kind of affirmative. Five teams broke this kind of affirmative. Oh, this team read this affirmative, but we don't think that one is topical. That one's different than all of the others. Uh, all of that kind of plays together to create expectations about what is legitimate, what is illegitimate. This is topical. This isn't topical. This is kind of cool. This is not cool. This is the trend. This is, you know, kind of old and not as cool anymore. Um, all of that helps you understand, better understand, what to expect in a debate, how you can prepare to excel in a debate, and most importantly, how you can win over an audience that doesn't even really know all of these biases that shapes it. So the, the interesting thing, one of the things that I find most interesting about high school debate is that debaters are really only what I would call varsity level competitors are really kind of conscious competitors that understand debate for about two years and then they move on to college debate. College debate has an outsized influence on high school debate, but in about four to six to at the most eight years, we've entirely turned over our community. And so what from someone who has been coaching for a long time seems like, oh, just a few years ago, you know, no one went for conditionality or everyone went for conditionality or consult counterplans were in every debate. I consult counterplans are cheating and can't be in any debate. Those types of changes can be really fast. And from the perspective of students, you really have no idea because you, know, you were five when the consult counterplan was at its heat of popularity. You were 12 when conditionality was at its height of popularity. And you, you tend to look back and you think, oh, well, when I was a freshman, when I first watched a varsity debate, I saw this team do this, and so that must be cool. And so that shapes your whole generation's understanding of debate. I think what separates great debaters is that they don't just kind of do all of that unthinkingly. They do that very consciously, and they think a lot 
about all of those various factors, they sort of psychoanalyze and play psychiatrist for the rest of their community. And they think, hmm, that's interesting how this argument was very popular and now it's not anymore. That's interesting how so many students who went to this camp or have been taught by this instructor think this about to be. And they don't take that for granted. They don't just accept that for what it is. They don't just accept the norms that have sort of been uh, unthinkingly put upon them, but they critically evaluate those. And I find it really interesting that debaters are so bad at this because so much of our curriculum in debate is about the critique and critical theory and questioning the way things are and not taking them for granted and trying to be critical intellectuals. But we're not very good, especially as students, and it, it is hard as a student because you just don't have as much history. But it, it is difficult for you and you, you often do not think more critically about why things are the way they are and then take advantage of that critical knowledge to try to make yourself a better debater, to try to position yourself better to win over judges, to try to manipulate your argumentative package, your delivery package, your set of optics, kind of the way you present yourself to maximize your chance of winning any particular debate. And that's what you will need to do for the rest of your life if you want to be a successful debater. And so part three is kind of the conclusions that I think I have drawn about what it is that understanding this fundamental principle of debate does to set apart a great debater from simply a good debater. So I will warn you that this is not a checklist of things that are really easy to do. This is not like you should flow or something like that. Sorry, it is warm. Uh, this is not something where you could just immediately implement these things. I'm like, all right, you listen to my lecture and then tomorrow you're like, you got it. It's not like that. Uh, these are things that are sort of foundational skills or approaches, kind of mentalities, ways to think about debate, I think is how I would summarize it. And the reason that these are so important is because these recognize the social nature of debate and these help debaters use that to their advantage and to gain a competitive advantage over their opponents in terms of connecting with their audience and winning over um, judges, whether those judges are policy debate judges, you know, justices on a court, business partners who you're trying to persuade to, to do a business deal. Number one is that great debaters have what is called strategic empathy. There is an interesting theory that some people have that sociopaths are really good debaters. Um, and to some extent, that is true. And the context of this literature is almost always about political debaters. Sociopaths, people who are unable to kind of feel emotions, uh, to have feelings like others, can be excellent kind of hitman style debaters. They can be kind of aggressive and they can intimidate their opponents. They can become unfazed in, in a heated debate. And it's really hard to rattle them or to get them off their script. Uh, and there's some interesting stuff I read in preparation for this. I was like, I need to confirm um, my, my feeling that I've read that before. And so I read a little bit more and it is interesting. There are theories about how sociopaths make for the, the most successful CEOs and things like that. But I don't think that sociopaths are good at winning competitive debates in front of an audience where the judge plays such an important role and where the judge values their role as arbiter of competing arguments. Uh, and the reason is that they can't understand their audience. They can't understand what their judge is thinking or feeling or the values or motivations of their judge. And perhaps even more importantly, they can't understand the motivations or values or feelings of their opponent. And I think you need to be able to do that in order to be a successful debater. So strategic empathy uh, can be defined in, in a few ways. There's kind of two contexts where this term is used a lot. One is in international relations and like military policy. The other is in leadership training for business people. And kind of the simplest definition is from the, the former field is the ability to think like one's enemies. So it's often suggested that military policymakers, um, foreign policy people, you know, John from John Kerry to Ashton Carter or whatever, they should have some training in strategic empathy so they can, for example, think about uh, what it would be like to be China and kind of put themselves in China's shoes. It would be the, the cliched way to describe this so they can kind of understand what would it be like from China's perspective. And the reason that that's so important in international relations and foreign policy is that oftentimes it's difficult to understand the motivations of your enemy and that leads to you misinterpreting the motivations for your enemy or the actions of your enemy and that can lead to miscalculation and all that. So it, in the, in the HSS thing that we just talked about, we talked about the chance of a war between the United States and China. A big part of getting that relationship right and avoiding that outcome is for both sides to understand one another's motivations so that they can uh, avoid that kind of miscalculation. In the other context, so in the context of business, um, and sometimes this can be in just 
uh, you know, some rich people just like buy leadership training to make them a, a better leader or make them a, a more effective um, person regardless of their field, is the ability to relate to someone. That's really just empathy, but kind of on demand or for the purpose of benefiting yourself. And the kind of cliched way to put that is you have to understand where someone's coming from. So in the business world, to, to get a deal, you gotta kind of understand the motivations of the person you're pitching, you gotta kind of get where they're coming from, what, what do they care about, what are their motivations, what are their values, uh, and then you tailor your pitch to meet those needs, to try to put yourself on their side, to say, hey, I, I get what you're coming, what you're saying, I get where you're coming from, I get it, I get you, and here's how I can help you. Uh, kind of the, the foundational, the simplest part of this is just you can't be self-centered and be a great debater. There are certainly some debaters who I kind of think of as great debaters who, who seem really arrogant or really competitive. And that's why it's strategic empathy, right? Even the most arrogant great debater, even the most obsessive, competitive, over-competitive even, great debater, the kinds of debaters that their opponents didn't really like debating that much because they were just so into it, but they were really good. They all had the ability to kind of, even though they were real aggressive, even though they were real competitive, think about the debate from their opponent's perspective and think about where their opponent is coming from. Think about what their opponents are good at and confident in. Think about what their opponents are bad at, what they're not confident in. Think about where their opponents are coming from in terms of their training, in terms of their experience, in terms of their values, in terms of you know, what do they care the most about? What are their greatest fears? Fears of failure in the debate? What are the kinds of arguments that you think they're really comfortable with? What are the kinds of arguments that they're not comfortable with? And just kind of what is driving them? How do they make decisions? How do they decide what to go for in the 2NR? How do they decide what to impact turn in the 2AC? How do they make those decisions? It's not unpredictable. It's just difficult to predict because you, you, you don't know their perspective. And an exceptional debater, just like an exceptional leader in business or an exceptional foreign policy diplomat, a John Kerry or whatever, they just have a, an astute capacity to get inside someone else's head. Or, or more importantly, sometimes get inside another person's heart and just figure out what makes them tick and figure out before they might even know what they're going to do, what they are likely to do. And you can't always get it right, but you can get it right a lot. And this is really the most important thing because I think so many debaters are so worried about their own performance. They're so worried about their own arguments. They're so worried about whether they're going to succeed or fail. A lot of debaters have a fear of failure. Others have a fear of success. But you've got all this baggage yourself. We're all messed up. We all have our concerns. We all have our neuroses. And debate brings out a lot of them. It's hard. We're tired. It's like max effort, mental game all the time. Debaters, like in, a, in an intense debate between good debaters, all the bad stuff comes out. And it's real easy to just spend all of your time thinking about yourself. Like, oh, I'm comfortable with this. Oh, I, if I was in this position, I would do this. Oh, I am very afraid of this, so I have to make sure that this doesn't happen. Oh, I am, I am worried about this. This is my biggest fear. This is the thing that I can't have happen. This is what would be really embarrassing to me. This is when I would totally fall apart. This is when others would mock me. And this is when you know, I'm gonna get bad feedback on Snapchat, and Facebook, and whatever. Uh, that we forget that the other person's going through the same thing. And so part of being awesome is being able to manage your own thing. But I think a lot of people help with that. And I do some, some lectures about mental preparation and emotional preparation, that kind of thing. Uh, but very few people tell you how to, how to deal with that and just mirror it, flip it around. Like all that stuff that you're going through, the other side's going through that too. So figure out what they're going through and figure out what they would do, what they're worried about, what they're most likely to do, what they're least likely to do. And then use that to kind of build a profile of your opponent and it becomes almost like uh, an intuitive thing. It's almost like telepathy. You just sort of feel your opponent. You feel where the debate is headed. You feel what kind of decisions they're going to make. And it seems then like all these great debaters must, like, they must have some kind of inside knowledge. They must have like gotten into the other side's email or something. They must have been spying on the other side's computer. They seem to always know what's going to happen next. Uh, there's another book which I found really interesting I haven't read the whole thing yet, but it, it was referenced in some articles that I was looking at. And it's by someone named Michael Mendelssohn, and it's a book called Many Sides. And he advances a theory of argumentation that's based on Protagoras. And uh, it says that according to the Greeks' record, Protagoras was the first person to say that, quote, on every issue there are two arguments opposed to each other. And then Mendelssohn says, out of this concept, Protagoras not only crafts the first set of instructions on the art of debate, 
He also initiates a process of reasoning by which contrary positions, which he called anti-logi or something like that, whatever the L-O-G-O-I is pronounced, or opposing reasons, are purposefully juxtaposed. As a result, resolution in any controversy constructed, on, constructed conducted along anti-logical lines is sought through a concerted effort to examine each stand in relation to its opposite numbers, which is confusing. But basically what that means is that in order to be a good debater, you have to constantly be putting two arguments together. You have to be putting the, the kind of argumentative opposites together. And you have to purposefully juxtapose them. You don't just kind of look at one and then look at another. You like make them fight each other. You make them clash. You figure out the, the intrinsic difference between them. And through a concerted effort to work through that controversy, to work through that dichotomy, you figure out the kind of the nature of the argument. You figure out the, the playing field of that particular argument. You figure out how that argument works. And so Mendelssohn uses this theory of Protagoras and Protagoran eidos, I think is how you say it, which means respect for others. Uh, and he uses uh, a theory from Buber, the philosopher, to say the following. Uh, Protagorean respect for others will manifest itself in the recognition of one's interlocutors, one's opponents in a debate, as free and independent subjects whose world is distinct from, but no less real than, one's own. That is, the debater is committed to comprehending not only the topic in general, but also, and in the first place, the claims of one's opponent and the context or worldview out of which these claims arise. So, kind of what I'm explaining, it's not just enough, it's not enough to exclusively understand the argument, kind of divorced from the person. It's important as you're understanding the argument to figure out the argument of the opposition. And I'm going to talk about kind of the way to do this on your own and the way to do this with regard to opponents in a debate. But the, the kind of crucial insight that I don't think we acknowledge enough is that you really can't understand an interplay of arguments without understanding your opponent, without understanding your audience. Because the audience and the opponent shape that interplay of arguments. It shapes what is a good argument, what is a bad argument. It shapes what argument is more persuasive than another. If we have a debate in front of a particular audience, you know, argument A might, might win the day, kind of objectively it would almost seem like, certainly that argument will win the day. In front, of our, in front of audience B, the exact opposite is true. Argument B would win the day, and it almost seems subjective. And I think a lot of debaters get frustrated with that because it's like, well, what is right, A or B? And one possibility is that debaters then are like, well, I guess it doesn't matter. It's either A or B. But the better reaction is to think that, well, you know, personally, I might think A, but depending on the context, the better argument is A or B, and figure out why. Uh, and this, this type of Protagorean argument is sometimes accused of being sophistry or whatever, Protagoras to, sophis, to uh, sophism is sort of the, the context for all of this. Uh, but here's what Mendelssohn says. Mendelssohn says sort of the opposite. Participants in dialogue must extend themselves beyond a cursory acknowledgement of one another's presence and seek instead to comprehend their interlocutors, their opponents, as fundamentally different from themselves. Dialogical argument, dialogical argument, the back and forth of argument, responds to these differences by encouraging the unfettered expression of the other's views. In the process of attending directly to my interlocutor, my debate opponent, to the distinguishing features of her ideas and attitudes, I confirm this same person as a free subject, a thou rather than an it, that's the boober part, a person with her own convictions and claims. In turn, by confirming the independence and authenticity of my debate partner, my opponent, I make it possible for this debater to reciprocate in kind, i.e. as a free subject herself, rather than simply the object of my rhetorical intention, rather than simply as the, the thing I'm going to beat in this debate, the stand-in for me to win against. Uh, my opponent is able to recognize and confirm in return those differences that distinguish my own unique person. So from the dialogical perspective, the very notion of personal identity takes on interpersonal dimensions. I emerge as myself in and through my relations with others, and in particular through the process of attending to someone else. So those of you who are familiar with Uber, that's the kind of I-thou theory. Uh, as it applies to debate, the point is that in order to be a great debater, you have to really understand other debaters. You have to really understand judges. You have to really understand not just one side, so the, the side in the literature that supports your affirmative, or the side in the literature that supports your nay, hey, you have to really understand the other side. And the, the crucial insight is that you have to give them the, the other side, whether it's your opponent in a debate, 
your judge who doesn't agree with you, the literature that doesn't agree with you, the authors on the other side of your AF or their, your K or whatever. You have to give them a maximum amount of respect. You have to take seriously the idea that they are arguing in good faith, that they have a sound basis for their opinion, that they have, you know, they have good values too, and that they have a perspective that is valid and worthy of your engagement and understanding. And when you do that, as a debater, you become a lot more open to the possibility that you're wrong. You become a lot more open to the possibility that others might disagree with you, even when you think you're right. And you become a lot more open to the idea that your opponent has something valuable to contribute, whether your opponent is your debate opponent, the team you're debating in round one at Green Hill, or argumentatively or content-wise, the opponent of your affirmative, the opponent of your critique. And I think debaters sometimes are pretty good about getting feedback from judges. Sometimes they're pretty good about getting feedback from coaches. But a lot of times, they're so invested in their own understanding of things. They're so invested in their own perception of what argument is correct, or what position is correct, or what debate practice is correct, that they are very poor at taking that feedback as not just a courtesy, like not just taking feedback to not be rude, or not just taking feedback because you're supposed to take feedback, but to really try to analyze and understand and evaluate and mill over, mull over and just sort of constantly think about that feedback and then connect that feedback to the feedback they get from other people, the feedback they get from other judges, the feedback they get from other coaches, from the feedback they get from reading different articles, from reading different positions. And strategic empathy allows you to put yourself in the position of whoever that is that you disagree with. And at the beginning, you might not even agree or disagree with any of it, but it's the ability to put yourself in the position of kind of all of these different interests. Uh, at the Supreme Court, we saw the pro-life people, we saw the pro-choice people, we saw the communist revolution people, we saw the crazy Tea Party people. Being able to put yourself in the position of each of them. Why are they making these arguments? Why are they so passionate about this? Why are they saying it in this way? Why did they decide to show up today to express this opinion? Not just to say, oh, they're just wrong, that they're mean-spirited, they don't know what they're talking about, but to instead really think about why it is they think that. And strategic empathy, and the reason that strategic empathy is the number one thing I want to talk about, is that if you do that all the time, it starts to just become second nature. Your, your immediate reaction to someone else's argument, uh, or an argument that disagrees with you, the neg's argument when you're affirmative, the ass argument when you're negative, the judge's argument when you lose, if your immediate reaction is, oh, idiot, or oh, that's wrong, or oh, how can I fight that argument next time? And if your immediate reaction is, okay, I want to understand that argument. I want to understand where that argument is coming from. I want to understand what motivates that argument. I want to understand the values underlying that argument. I want to understand why this person thinks that argument is true. I want to understand why this person gave me that advice. If that's your first reaction, instead of I have to figure out how to answer that argument, then you end up accumulating this, this huge supply of sort of psychological information about others. You accumulate this huge supply of insights into how other people think. You, you get this huge insight or this huge collection of information about how others decide things and how they, you know, how they choose or prefer one argument over another. And that all can then be directly entered into your kind of emotional processing center, your empathy center. And it can help you figure out what your opponents are thinking, what your judges are thinking, what the likely responses to your arguments will be, what the likely decisions within a debate will be. Uh, and all of that can make you a much better debater. So number one is strategic empathy. Number two, great debaters are self-deliberating. Self-deliberating. Debaters who really are great at debate kind of always are thinking about debate. Not necessarily consciously or on purpose, but they just sort of see debate in everything. If you're a great debater and you're really into soccer, you see debate in soccer. You see things in soccer that can provide some insights into debate, whether that's the strategy of soccer, the economics of soccer, the interplay between rivalries in soccer, the strategy, the on-field strategy, the, the kind of off-field player acquisition strategy, uh, the cultural or historical significance of soccer in different countries. You're just kind of always thinking about, oh, soccer, that's, that's interesting how this theory of soccer could be applied to debate, or how this thing about soccer uh, reminds me of this thing about debate. Here's an idea that I can draw from soccer to debate. Uh, and in that way, you're kind of always open to thinking and making connections between things that other people don't really see connections between. So maybe in your math class, you're learning a certain mathematical concept. You're kind of always thinking, interesting how that works, interesting how this theory plays out, or that's an interesting way to think about things. I wonder how that would apply to debate, or it applies to debate in this way. Or you learn about history, and you're constantly thinking about, oh, interesting. There's a connection to this thing that I know about debate 
from that, or, or interesting how this textbook is making this argument. It's interesting which facts this textbook chose to include and not include. It's interesting what the primary things that this chapter is talking about in this aspect of my you know, American history book or European history book, and which things aren't being talked about. It's interesting, too, when the teacher provides a reading from Chomsky or whatever, from um, Gore Vidal. It's like, interesting how that presentation, like, why do we have this as the textbook and this as the supplemental reading? Why, how is this different? And kind of your school will teach you uh, in that context, you know, like here, compare and contrast these two things. But really good debaters are, are thinking a lot more than that. They're thinking a lot more deeply than that. And they're making a lot of connections that the average student doesn't. I know a lot of you are really interested in video games. I've been very, I don't play video games anymore, but I've been very interested in the intersection between game design and video game design and framework and topicality because there's a lot of similarities when we're designing a, a good video game. A video game that is playable, a video game that is challenging enough but not too challenging, a video game that uh, is kind of accessible to all players but that still maintains uh, the interest of those players, a game that you know, is long enough that it, it keeps you involved in it, but not so long that players give up. There's like all these interesting concepts about video game design, and I'm reading about those, and I'm thinking, you oh, know, that's interesting how we design debate. Uh, regardless of what your interest is, fashion, cooking, I think a lot about, I watch cooking shows, and I always think about cooking, and how the cooking shows have something to do about debate. You know, what you can learn from debate from Top Chef, what you can learn from debate from Chop. I love baseball. Almost all sports have things that can be um, learned from, and kind of concepts that you can take from them and move them into debate. Another part of this is that great debaters really know what they don't know. And it's not that they think they don't know anything, because most great debaters are very intelligent and they know a lot of things. But they don't think that they know everything. And they understand that what they know is constantly less than what others know. Um, there's a tendency among debaters who are really good in high school, really good high school debaters, uh, to think that because they know more than their peers, they must be the best, they know everything. Uh, and that makes sense, because within your community, there are certain students who know a ton about the topic, or know a ton about the K, or are like, really good at you know, X thing. But in the grand scheme of things, they know very little. So even the debater that knew a ton about, on this topic, the debater that knows a ton about the bilateral investment treaty, if we made a list of all the people in the world who know a lot about the bilateral investment treaty, that debater would be very near the bottom. Uh, certainly the vast majority of the world's population knows nothing, but like, of the people who know something about the bit, debaters, even the best one, very near the bottom. Uh, and knowing that, you kind of constantly have an appetite for more. You constantly have an appetite for people to tell you, uh, actually, here, here's a place where you've gotten that a little bit wrong, or here's something interesting to think about. The way you're saying this, you know, maybe that's, that could be true, or that could be a correct argument, or a valuable argument. But here's a counter argument that you should think about, because I think it draws uh, an interesting comparison, or because it calls into question kind of a foundational thing that you've taken for granted. You know, here's something that I think you should read that really resonated with me or that I think is really intelligent and I think it draws, uh, you could draw some insight from it, stuff like that. And so all good debaters kind of have to master a certain amount of content and that amount of content keeps getting bigger. So you need to know stuff about the topic, you need to know stuff about generic impact terms like whether civilizational collapse is good or bad is sort of a stock issue, whether, you know, the, whether death is good or bad is sort of a stock issue, all these critical um, ideas about different theories, you have to know stuff about whether reality is real, you have to know about Baudrillard, you have to know about Barr, you have to know about uh, Foucault, and about all this kind of stuff. So you have to know about a lot of stuff, and so obviously debaters who know stuff uh, are better than debaters who don't know stuff. But what's up with great debaters, they really want to know more stuff, and they're really interested in learning more stuff. They don't want to settle for just knowing what they know. A lot of good debaters will get to a certain level where they can just like, they can win the death K usually, or they can win the politics DA usually. And they're good with that, because their goal is just to win those debates, and those debaters can be very successful. But the great debater never seems to settle for, I know this much, they're always deliberating, they're always thinking, they're always trying to get smarter, they're always trying to get better. And as a result of that, uh, in combination with the strategic empathy idea that I discussed, the greatest debaters seem to have almost x-ray vision or like telepathic ability, like they can almost predict the future because they really understand the evolution of arguments and they understand uh, because they're kind of trying to stay ahead of their opponents and figuring things out, and working through things and deepening things and broadening things and getting to the next level of everything that they kind of know what their opponents are going to do next. They kind of know what the, the coaches of other teams are going to do next, because they have a sense of what's, what's going to happen next, because uh, they've gone through that process and they're thinking about that process. So if you know that as you start digging deeper into you know, this team's affirmative uh, or into this critique, that you're going to come across this article, and you know, that had some interesting ideas in it. And if you kind of read that and put that together, you might come across this thing, and that's a, a, an interesting take on the critique, or that's an interesting answer to this affirmative. If you kind of work through that, then you know that others might work through that. And so you might think, oh, well, others are going to do that. What if we read this critique and we know they're going to say this in response because that's the easiest answer to come up with. That's what they'll likely come up with. 
Uh, what if we prepare an answer to that? And then we're one step ahead of them. And then when they read that and you have your responses, they're like, oh, did you steal our Dropbox password? I'm like, no, we didn't steal your Dropbox password. We just, we've been thinking about this a lot. And I think in modern today, you all have so many things that take up your thinking time. You're all, you know, any downtime is on your phone, on your, on your video games, on Snapchat or whatever. You don't just think very much. And I think great debaters spend some time every day thinking about debate. There was a really um, great debater, and I can't remember, I think I said this wrong in a lecture before, and so now I'm totally uh, second-guessing myself about who this was. But it was either Seth Gannon or Andrew Arsh. Um, we were in a lab together a few years ago. Um, they came and visited the lab. And we, the students asked them, what is your best suggestion, uh, one suggestion for debate? And one of them, I'm going to go with Seth, but I don't know for sure, said, think about debate every day while you're taking a shower. And everybody laughed. But I thought about it, and like, that is a really good piece of advice, because I think it gets at what I'm saying, which is that you need to be thinking about debate. You need to be having some time where you're not playing video games, where you're not thinking about school, where you're not chatting with someone, or watching Netflix, or YouTube, or whatever. And it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with those things. But you need to find some time for yourself to just think. Think through debate. Think through how debates are going to play out. Um, I have a lecture called uh, Strategic Awareness that's on my YouTube channel that if you haven't watched, it uh, provides a lot of insight into this kind of how to use that thinking time to anticipate what your opponent is going to say. But for the purpose of this um, lecture and for the purpose of this point, the, the thing I want you to take away is just that great debaters are self-deliberating. Great debaters are constantly thinking about debate and their knowledge of debate, their knowledge of the arguments, their knowledge of their opponents, their knowledge of their judges, their knowledge of the way that the topic is progressing, the knowledge of how things are going to go at the, at the tournaments that they really care about. And that's distinct from the way that a lot of debaters you know, think about debate. I think when a lot of you would tell your parents, you know, I'm working on debate, what you really mean is, uh, you know, at the best case, I'm sort of multitasking and doing a little bit of research, or maybe I'm watching college debates that have been recorded, I'm sort of chatting with my friends, I'm just sort of watching them as if, as a spectator, kind of like I would watch a baseball game if I wasn't that interested in the outcome, just sort of enjoying it, it's entertaining. Um, and in the worst case, you're really just talking to your friends and sort of gossiping about debate, but you're not really thinking about debate. Uh, the kind of thinking about debate that I'm talking about is really thinking through debate, sort of like chess masters think through the interplay of moves in a chess game, or uh, the way that uh, people who are making arguments in the scholarly literature kind of just think about, all right, how can I frame this? How can I make this argument better? If I say this, what is the best response? What, what kind of response will undercut my point? Um, if I read this critique against this team, what are they going to say? Okay, well then what am I going to say? Uh, and if I say that, what are they going to say? Okay, well, what kind of judges am I going to get in that spot? What do they think about this argument? What do they think about this argument? You know, what could go wrong? You just kind of really think about all of that. I think that's what separates great debaters. Um, they, they just think about debate a lot, and they think about it in a way that is a little bit more sophisticated than what I think most debaters think about it. Uh, number three, great debaters are generous to opposing arguments. I think this is a really important one, and this one is a little bit more concrete, maybe. You should always answer the best version of your opponent's arguments, or at least be prepared to answer the best version of your opponent's arguments. Be ready to answer the best version of your opponent's arguments. That Aiken and Talis book uh, that I talked about before has uh, kind of a dichotomy of straw person arguments. Oftentimes we'll hear about straw person arguments, but they distinguish between three different types. So the traditional straw person argument uh, the weak person argument and the hollow person argument. And I think all of these are common in debates. So according to them, they have this taxonomy of straw person argument. Uh, straw person fallacy, kind of the traditional straw person, is misrepresenting your opponent's position. So saying that they said something or meant something that they didn't say or mean. The weak person fallacy is responding to the weakest argument of your opponent, the weakest version, the weakest understanding, the version of your opponent's argument that, that is the easiest to respond to, the, the worst from your opponent's perspective. And the hollow person fallacy is fabricating an argument on behalf of your opponent. So I see, I see all of those things in debate a lot, and the, the fundamental motivation is that you want to win, and so you want your opponent's arguments to be really bad. And the worse your opponent's arguments, the greater chance you win. Like, that makes sense, I get it. But Unfortunately, though, kind of your instinct to make their arguments worse doesn't actually make their arguments worse. And sometimes an initially weak argument from your opponent blossoms into a pretty good argument later in the debate. Sometimes that's intentional, sometimes that's unintentional. Uh, sometimes it takes a while for the, for the other side to kind of figure things out and make their arguments strong. But the best debaters are very generous to their opponent's arguments. 
Not to the sense that they you know, spend too much time on bad arguments or whatever, but instead that they kind of think about their opponent's argument and think, okay, well, what is the best version of this? What could this argument become? How could this argument be developed in the later speeches? What, what is there maybe behind the surface of this argument? And if that exists behind the surface, how are we going to respond to that argument? How are we going to defeat that argument? You don't hope that the argument really is as bad as your initial read of it is. Or you don't, uh, sometimes it's even worse than that. The argument is actually pretty good, but because you need it to be bad, you just kind of look at it and it becomes bad. You like make it bad in your own opinion, in your own head. You convince yourself that their argument is poor. Uh, one of the things that I think even good debaters struggle with, and that, that um, I often hear from even pretty good debaters, is that the judge will say something like, after the debate, like, you know, I voted for this team, this is the argument I voted on, and they'll, they'll, you know, the, the debater or team that lost will be, I'll sit down and say, wait, hang on a second. Did they say that? Did they say that? What did they say? They didn't say that. They, they didn't say all of that. They didn't say enough there. Um, the, the thing, uh, actually, Brian doesn't know, Brian used the term that a lot of people use, there wasn't enough ink there, or something like that. They didn't spend enough time there. Um, and that, that can be frustrating. It's understandable why, when that happens, you'd be frustrated by that loss. But almost always, the real result of that loss, or the real reason that a team lost, is because they underestimated the strength of an opponent's argument. Or, even if they didn't underestimate the strength of the argument, in the abstract, they underestimated the strength of the argument in the opinion of the judge. They were unable to put themselves in the judge's position and think to themselves, all right, from the position of this judge, could this argument be a credible, round-winning argument? Could this argument be persuasive? Could the judge buy this argument? To use another one of those phrases that I don't like, but that is very common. Uh, and why? What is it about the argument that the judge finds appealing that I didn't find appealing? And so the best debaters, the great debaters, rarely lose that kind of debate because they acknowledge from the beginning that the judge might think more highly of their opponent's arguments than they personally do. And in fact, should. It doesn't make sense that you, who really wants to win and really wants to have the better arguments and are invested in your own arguments, would have an equally fair understanding of your opponent's arguments to the judge who's just sitting there being a neutral arbiter who's not invested in the arguments at all. So it makes sense, naturally, for the judge to find your arguments, your opponent's arguments, more convincing than you do, and for the judge to find your own arguments less convincing than you do. And so a great debater knows that, and a great debater adapts to that from the very beginning. A great debater adapts that before the debate, during the debate, during the end stages of the debate. And they're generous to their opponent's argument because they know the judge might be generous to their opponent's argument. And I think that's one thing that can kind of immediately be implemented into even good debaters' arsenals, uh, is just don't answer the argument you wish they had made, answer the argument they didn't make or could develop in later speeches. Uh, I know that that runs contrary to a lot of people's instincts. They're like, well, I shouldn't have to answer if they haven't made it yet. I get it. But if you're thinking like that, your floor, your kind of ceiling is as a good debater who wins some, but not a lot, you're definitely not going to be a great debater if that's how you think about debate. Number four, great debaters are obsessed with cross-examination. And not just cross-examination during a debate, but cross-examination as a tactic of preparation, as a way to test themselves, as a way to test arguments, as a way to think about how to frame things, how to set the tone for a debate, how to set the tone for a line of argument that will find its way into the final rebuttal, how to figure out final rebuttal strategies, how to test strategies before you implement them. I think pretty much every great debater, I shouldn't even say pretty much, every great debater that I can think of when I think in my mind great debaters, they were all great at cross-examination. Cross-examination is the most important part of debate. Because you can't be good at cross-examination. You can be acceptable at cross-examination. You can't be good or great at cross-examination without really understanding the arguments, without really understanding how a debate works, without understanding kind of strategy and late rebuttal dynamics and the evolution of competing ballots over the course of a debate, the interplay between arguments, different positions, the kind of top-level meta contrast between the two sides' arguments if you're, uh, you can't be, a good, be good uh, at cross-examination if you don't understand that. I think that the very best debates that we have in society are debates that are just cross-examination. The litigation before an appellate court or the Supreme Court, that's really just cross-examination. Uh, great public debates are really just cross-examination. They're back and forth. They're one person uh, or one team, one side, asking really difficult questions of another side, and then that side having to respond, and then volley questions back to the other side, kind of constantly testing one another's arguments, pushing, uh, setting up arguments, getting commitments, 
clarifying for the audience points of clash, points of agreement, identifying nexus issues, all of that happens in the cross-examination. But so many debaters, when they think about preparing for debates, cross-examination is not even part of it. You talk about what affirmative should we read this year. Uh, you talk about what affirmative should we read in a particular debate. What affirmative should we read in round one at Greenhill? You're talking about well, what counter plan are they going to say? What dissent are they going to say? What case neg are they going to have from camp? You know, what, what do we like going for? Or what can we win as topical or whatever? You don't really think about, all right, what can we really defend? What, what, can, we, what can we support in the face of a strong opponent cross-examination? And sometimes affirmatives that seem like good ideas uh, in the abstract, like, hey, we'll read a QPQF, then we don't have to answer TQPQ, and I'll read uh, an AF that you know, Trump would like, because then that messes with the politics DA, and I'll read an AF that matches up good against this process counterplan or whatever, and you like, kind of think things through like that. Uh, but then at the end, you know, a devastating cross-examination reveals just huge problems with your affirmative. It reveals big holes in your internal links, or it reveals like a clear dissat or a clear counterplan that you didn't even really think about, because you were only thinking about how does this match up um, with other positions. It's not that you shouldn't think about how things match up with elections or topicality or counterplans, but begin by thoroughly vetting your choice of affirmative, thoroughly vetting your idea about what to read in round one, just like the presidential candidates are thoroughly vetting their, their vice presidential picks. Uh, Hillary Clinton's not just going to be like, oh, Elizabeth Warren, that sounds good. Uh, Bernie Sanders supporters like Elizabeth Warren? All right, done. Uh, there's going to be a lot of cross-secs going on there. They're going to think about you know, what does that mean for the Massachusetts Senate seat? What does that mean for this demographic? What does that mean for this demographic? What does that mean for this state? What does that mean for this state? You know, what is that? What about this alternative? What about this other alternative? And that process will be ongoing and it will be in depth, and they'll spend lots and lots and lots of money figuring that out. Uh, a similar thing applies to your affirmative. When debaters prepare to be negative, there's rarely any time spent thinking about cross-examination. That's one thing that I like to do when coaching before debates is map out a cross-ex at the one I see but I rarely see other students doing that. That used to be a little bit more common, actually, than it is now. But you should think a lot about when you're negative, what is the first thing I'm going to say in the debate? And the first thing you say in the debate is not your 1NC, it is your CX of the 1AC. If you crush the CX of the 1AC, and based on figuring out how to crush a CX of the 1NC, design your 1NC to support the eventual 2NR that you've settled on as your number one option for that debate, then you have a clear strategy, you have an opening presentation that builds credibility, that immediately contributes to a negative win. You go into the debate confident. You stand up and in the first moment, the second negative seems like they've owned this debate. They know what's going on in this debate. They're ready to win this debate. You immediately communicate to the affirmative. That they, they better be ready to debate because you came to debate. You came to defeat them, not just to have something to say against them. Um, and I think great debaters understand the significance of cross-examination. You should always be cross-examining yourself. Cross-examine your practice 2NCs, cross-examine your practice 1ARs, your practice 2NRs, your practice 2ARs. There's no cross-examination of those speeches in a debate, but that's what the judge does. The judge basically cross-exes those speeches for themselves, and then often in a way that is disparaging to your argument. They ask, you know, hey, 2AR, this argument, was that even in the 1AR? Hey, 2AR, this argument, that's not very good. Hey, 2AR, this card, it's not so good. It doesn't really say that. Uh, and so if you think like that, if you can think, I could withstand a strong cross-ex of my 2AR, then that's a great way to figure out how to give a great 2AR. A lot of students will ask me, you know, how do I give a good 2AR? How do I give a good 2NR? Well, just give a good one. Like, it's, it's almost self-definitional. Like, the, the hard part is figuring out what, whether you are right, whether your arguments are correct in light of the matchup between previous speeches, in light of the trajectory of the debate. And the best way to figure that out is just aggressively cross-ex them. Uh, aggressively cross-ex them yourself as you are debating. Constantly be asking yourself questions. Constantly be thinking about what questions you would ask of the opponent's arguments and then answer them for yourself. One of the things that great debaters have uh, the ability to do is kind of figure out evidence quality of the other team. That's because they're really thinking about it. They kind of identify early in the debate. Let's say they're negative and they have a counterplan. They just kind of hone in based on some of the variables we've already talked about. If we go for this counterplan, this is the solvency deficit that they'll need to go for to win the debate. This is the piece of evidence that they'll need to go for and hand the judge as the evidence for that solvency deficit. This is kind of the, the, this is the evidence. This is the most generous reading of the evidence for the affirmative. This is the criticism that we could still have of that evidence. This is how we're going to critique that evidence throughout the course of the debate. And if you've really thought that through, the opening question of the cross-examination of the 1AC is about that solvency deficit card. The 1NC maybe has a card in it that's specifically designed to answer that solvency deficit argument. The 2NC or 1NR, when they're extending the counterplan, they begin by saying, 
their answer to this counterplan is this card, but, and then they answer that argument with a couple of bullet points with catchy labels or bumper stickers that could be extended in the two in arm. When the affirmative reads more evidence, they zone in on that evidence, they focus in on that evidence, and they say, nope, this evidence doesn't support that argument, it's still this initial card that they need to win this debate. And then again, the 2NR continues that narrative. That card will not win the solvency deficit. Our card about this answers this. Our card about this answers this. This part of their card doesn't support their plan because their plan doesn't do what that card advocates. There's no impact to this part of the card. You know, as the evidence set, our evidence is more uh, qualified, it has better credentials than this evidence. This is a misreading of this evidence, whatever. And by the end of that, you've developed a cohesive strategy built entirely around difficult questions of the affirmative solvency evidence versus the negative solvency evidence. And that whole time, you have to be critical of your own evidence. You have to be saying the same kind of hard-hitting questions of your own evidence, like, is this card really good enough? Does this card really answer that affirmative argument? And you have to be honest with yourself, and you have to understand, sometimes the judge is going to say no. And so the best final rebuttalists kind of have figured all of that out, and then they can talk a lot about that. You know. Here's our arguments against their card. Even if this card that we say takes out this part of their card is wrong, here's why we still solve enough of the case for our dissent to outweigh. Even if this card is older, here's why it doesn't matter because it takes into account the argument that their evidence says, and this are, you know, time doesn't matter for this argument. Even if you think that their argument is a, their evidence is a little bit better than ours, it's not so much better that they can win a tangible solvency deficit. Even if they do win a tangible solvency deficit, it's still relatively small because dot, dot, dot. And if it is relatively small, our dissent outweighs dot, dot, dot. All of that can really only be figured out by thinking about debate with the lens of cross-examination, with the lens of all of my speeches, even the ones that are not actually cross-examined, will functionally be cross-examined. Every piece of evidence that we read, every argument that we read, every argument that we make, every framing statement, every overview, all of that functionally is cross-examined. So let's try to do that cross-examination ourselves. Let's always be cross-examined. Number five, great debaters are always attentive to optics. The uh, classic example of optics changing the way that um, debates are decided is the Nixon-Kennedy presidential debates, where if you look at the transcript, a lot of people will suggest that Nixon won. If you watch it on the video feed on television, you'll think that Kennedy won. This insight has been fundamental kind of since forever, but in the television age, it's particularly um, apt and particularly important. But basically, it's not just about what you've said. It's not just about what's in your speech documents. It's not just about you know, the arguments that you think you are making or that even to be a little bit more generous that you think your judge is understanding. It's about their overall understanding of your presentation, their overall impression of you. And you learn that. You, you all get an ethos lecture or whatever. You kind of learn that ethos matters, and it matters if you're credible, and it matters, all of that. But absolutely everything you do has an optics component. It has a how does this look component? How does this appear to the judge? What's the judge's reaction going to be to this? What if we framed it instead like this? What if we called it this instead of that? What if we introduced it in this order instead of that order? What if we asked the question like this instead of like this? What if we sat over here instead of over here? What if we give this cross-examination from here versus from here? What if we, uh, when we stand and give our speech, what if we start a little bit more aggressive? What if we start a little bit calmer? What is that going to inspire in the opponent? What is that going to inspire in the judge? How can we, how are we dressed? How does the way that we are dressed contrast with how they are dressed and with the expectations of the judge? What are the power dynamics in the room? How do we, you know, do, how do we conduct uh, disclosure before the debate? How do we set up an email chain? What do we do when the other team stops speaking? How are we looking when we're sitting down? That's part of the Nixon uh, Kennedy debate is that Nixon was sweating and Nixon looked a little uh, iffy during Kennedy's speech. He didn't really know what to do. He was sort of looked a little flustered. Uh, and if you didn't see him, you wouldn't know that. But your judge sees you. And so how are you managing your, your, your personhood, your personal space, your presentation, your brand? Uh, and that's true not just of an individual debate, but how are you managing your brand in general? Great debaters have a brand, just like companies have a brand or basketball stars have a brand. Steph Curry has a brand. There's just something that is Steph Curry, and he's careful to manage his brand. That brand involves uh, all of his public appearances. It involves the advertising campaigns that he does. It involves the way he addresses the media, his social media accounts. All of that kind of forms the brand of Steph Curry, and it results in people thinking of Steph Curry in a particular way. Debaters have the same ability to shape how others see them. And you have to be thinking about that. What do you look like? What do others think of you? 
How does your presentation in a debate shape the way that others think about you? How's your reputation? Uh, how does that play with your judges? And you can kind of tweak that from debate to debate, but your overall reputation, the overall perception that you want others to have is that you are a credible, competent, excellent debater. You want judges to enjoy judging you. You want other teams to respect you. You want other coaches to respect you. You want to be one of those teams that, that people like, because if people like you, you have a greater chance to win the debate. Not everyone is going to like you, though, so you have to figure out how can you manage those types of relationships? How can you manage situations where you're not as well liked? How can you manage situations where the other team doesn't like you? How can you manage situations where you know the other team has some kind of upper hand in the power relationship between the two teams and the judge? Um, but all the time, you kind of have to think about brand management, optic management. How can you you know, avoid doing the kinds of things that just needlessly distort or destroy your brand. And most students do things all the time that distort or destroy their brand. They do things that undermine their reputation or their credibility. They do things that make them look bad. They do things that you know, get them talked about in a negative way. And great debaters rarely do that. Or if they do, uh, it's a few exceptions to an overall brand that embodies competency, professionalism, excellence, uh, and just great debating. Just like you know, Steph Curry might have an incident, there might be something on social media that makes him look bad, but because he has built a good brand, because he's generally, his favorability is very high, to use the political term, he doesn't take a huge hit from that. But other players, if they do something that maybe isn't even less bad than this hypothetical incident that Steph Curry did, they take a bigger hit because their baseline favorability level is a lot lower. So you should try to cultivate favorability, you should try to cultivate a brand, that can be sustained throughout the course of your year. If you're a junior, you've got two years to do it. If you're a senior, you've got one year to do it. But you should always be thinking about that, and you should be conscious of how everything looks. Uh, number six, and the last one, is that great debaters are Janus-like. And by Janus, I mean the Roman god of beginnings and endings, and also other things like gates and transitions and time and doorways and passages, etc. But Janus is the god that is pictured with two faces, one facing forward and one facing backward. And I think great debaters within debates and outside of debates think backward and forward simultaneously. Within a debate, they think back to the beginning of the debate as the debate is progressing. But at the same time, they look forward toward the end of the debate. They never get too hung up on what happened before. They never lose sight of what's happening to come. And they use their insights from what happened before to help shape their understanding of what is going to happen in the end of the debate. And the whole thing is about winning that end game. And so if something bad happens in the initial stages of the debate, they're okay with that because their eye is on the end of the debate. If something happens good in the beginning of the debate, they're not too high, they're not too optimistic. They don't phone in the rest of the debate because they're, they're looking forward and they're seeing there's still some cliffs to avoid, there's still some potential pitfalls that they have to uh, avoid as they're making their way toward winning the ballot. And what that does is it helps you think about the nexus issues in a debate, how they've evolved from the beginning of the debate to the end of the debate. Uh, my lecture about strategic um, awareness and situational awareness is helpful on this if you haven't watched it before. I referenced that before. Uh, but outside of debate, the same thing is true. Debaters don't get obsessed about all of the debates that have already happened. They don't let any one debate or one debate tournament overly influence their opinion about the rest of the season or the rest of their debate career. They take it for what it is. It's one sample, it's one incident, it's one tournament, it's one round, whatever, one iteration. And they try to learn from it, but they're constantly looking forward. They're constantly figuring out, all right, well, what does this debate do to change the future of this tournament, of this season, of this career? How can I use what happened here to get better, to learn something about the future of debate, about my next debate, or about next year's debate? And every debate, whether you win or lose, whether you win a tournament or lose a tournament, or whether you, you know, lose a particular debate that you were really upset about, and it was to a, a, you know, a rival school or a rival team, and you were real upset and you didn't agree with the decision, don't, don't get obsessed with that. Some people will come home and they'll be like, I'm never losing to that again. I'm going to spend all my time making sure that I don't lose to that. But you're not Janus then. You're only looking that way. You're only, not even thinking about the future. Uh, don't, don't get so obsessed with what has happened before that you lose sight of what's going to happen uh, in the future. And you can kind of think that way with a season as well. A lot of you have goals to be really good, you need to have a really successful season, and you can't control whether you have a really good tournament, but you can kind of control whether you have a really good season. So just sort of think about what are the tournaments that are really important to me this year? What are the tournaments where I want to peak at? What are the tournaments where I want to be at my best, where I want to have the best chance of having a great individual tournament? And kind of look, 
look back and look forward and try to design a season that focuses on accomplishing those goals. And the same is true of an individual tournament. You know, what can I, what can we do during the preliminary rounds to best set us up to win in the elimination rounds? Is this a tournament where we just have to try to win every single debate with the maximum amount of effort and the maximum amount of arguments? And who cares if we save anything for later debates? You know, think about that. If this is a tournament where ah, I think we'll save this, this new affirmative for later, we'll save this new negative to set for later, we'll save this new topicality argument for later. Because we're looking there and we're looking there, and in order to win out there, I think we've got to save it, something like that. But you've got to constantly be thinking about that. Um, and I think that that's one of the attributes of great debaters that sometimes even good debaters miss. Good debaters can be highly affected by an individual debate or by an individual tournament. So, you know, some teams that I think are going to have a really good year go three and three at Greenhill, and they're, they're just done for the first semester because they have a crisis of confidence. We lost three debates. We didn't even clear. This is so embarrassing. This is horrible. We're, we're not going to be good this year. Other teams will go, you know, five and one, and they, they had an affirmative that most of the other teams hadn't prepared for. They win the doubles. They win the octaves. They get an upset win in the quarter, and somehow they're in the semis. They're like, oh, we got it made. This is the blueprint. This is how we're going to win every tournament this year. And for both of those situations, that's not true. That three and three team might have just had a couple of fluky losses. They weren't ready for a couple things, but if they get ready on those things, if they're looking forward, there's a lot of kind of green grass in front of them. They're going to have a pretty successful year. Maybe that team that was in the semis, if they're being realistic and not just obsessing over the trophy they got and they're looking forward, they're like, eh, the fundamentals of this aren't very strong. We kind of got lucky. We caught some people off guard. We didn't debate that well. There was that 2-1 in the doubles where realistically we probably lost that one, but we got lucky. So we got to make some changes even though we were just in the semis, because if we want to be in the semis again, we're going to have to be a lot better. We're going to have to have different arguments. We're going to have to be better prepared. And I think that's what separates a great debater, because they understand that what happened before isn't necessarily what's going to happen in the future, either within a debate or within the context of a debate season. So summarizing all of this, the fundamental insight that I would share with you is that debate is social. It is an interaction between people, unique people with unique values, with their own background, with their own perspective, with their own understandings of arguments, of debate, and of larger questions, philosophical questions. And the more that you can understand that, and the more that you can prepare to debate with that in mind, the greater chance you have to be one of the debaters that everyone remembers as an excellent debater. Uh, and the greater chance you have to be the kind of debater who succeeds in whatever you do in life, whether you're an academic, or a lawyer, or a doctor who's you know, trying to convince you know, other doctors at your hospital or at your surgical clinic, that this is the, the next wave method of this type of surgery, or you know, this is the treatment option that needs to be in place for this patient, or, or a business person who's trying to win, you know, win over a merger, or someone who's trying to, you know, a consultant trying to convince a company to adopt X policy. Knowing your audience and knowing that everyone is kind of coming to the debate from a different place, and to the extent possible, you've got to figure out the place they're coming from, what they're bringing to the table, their backpack of stuff that they don't even really know is there, the greater chance you have of being successful in that endeavor. And so that's my universal theory of a great debater. And that is it. So I will turn off the camera.